Yeah, hi. Thanks for coming along this afternoon. Uh, yeah, my name is Stuart Coop. I'm a director of Laughing Outlaw Records, which is uh, an independent record label based in Sydney. Uh, I've been a journalist, a manager, a tour promoter, just about anything except a musician, because I'm no good at that sort of stuff. Um, we've got a great panel here today who are going to attempt in the now to explain as much as they possibly can about how the Australian music industry operates, give you some tips and things, things to do, things not to do. I called it, it's a long way away because physically it is. I mean, it's 13 hours on a plane from LA to Sydney, it's 18 from New York City, and 24 from London. Uh, and so, you know, whichever way you look at it, it's a long way to travel. We've got a population of about 22 million. Uh, a gold record is 35,000 copies. A platinum album is 70,000 copies. Those of you who know what the figures are in this country will realise just what a small number. But if you go to New Zealand, it's 9,000. Uh, we have six or so major cities in a country that has pretty much the same land mass as North America, and there's a whole lot of nothing around those cities. Uh, we also have more festivals than I would imagine probably some of the panel may, uh, may, may correct me than uh, just about any country on the planet. It's a fantastic country to go to because our peak touring season and when most of the activity happens is when it's freezing in the Northern Hemisphere. So, um, and it has just a fantastic music culture. So, the panel today, I'll start down the very end. Um, Ian James has been the head of Mushroom Publishing based in Melbourne for, did we say 25 years? 25 years in the last year. Yeah, okay. Um, Graham Ashton, uh, next to Ian, has uh, been active in the music industry for many, many years, but wearing any number of hats from working for record labels, um, nurturing new bands. Uh, he is the person that currently runs the Big Sound Music Conference that's held in Brisbane every year. Big Sound, if you imagine a mini, 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 times 10, uh, uh, South by Southwest, you'd have Big Sound, but it's become the conference to go to and a really pivotal event in the Australian calendar. Uh, Next to Graham is Emily York, who is a promoter come agent with a company called Penny Drop. And uh, next to me is Justin Cosby, uh, who's head of A&R at Inertia, who are a major label and a distribution company. So I thought we'd, uh, we'd start, Justin, with you, and just talking about what you at Inertia look for in an artist from overseas, what are the sort of things where you go, hey, this is viable for me, you know, in our market. Um, I don't think it, it, what we would look for at home is anything different to what anyone would look for. Um, you're looking for a band that has great songs. Um, you're also looking for one that essentially is going to have some sort of cultural uh, reference point that is people are going to identify with um, and that media essentially are going to support because obviously you have to get the word out there to, for other people to be aware of that act and then subsequently subscribe to the cultural experience that band's offering. And uh, also I'm interested in your thoughts, Justin, just on, on the importance, I mean we have a very, very strong and vibrant live scene in Australia. How, I mean, can, can a newish artist get away with just having a release or how, how important is, you know, a close follow-up with live performance and a consistency of live performance? Well, live is, is certainly very important. Um, there is there's a, uh, a volume of, and a level of media that you can essentially access a lot easier and with the touring support, because obviously a lot of media actually prefer to concentrate on the touring acts and those things because it's got to a certain level of awareness. Um, you're obviously putting yourself in front of uh, a large audience. A lot of emerging acts would generally start, correct me if I'm wrong here, would actually start maybe with a built around a festival run, which can actually sort of help bankroll the actual um, tour coming out. Um, that's obviously great for the act as well because it's going to put them in front of a much larger audience and help actually grow their fan base and their awareness. Um, maybe do a few club shows around that and then as they grow in their popularity they can start you know, returning and doing their own club shows and incrementally find themselves at, at larger venues. Um, it, it, is, it is very important but by the same token it's it's, as Stuart was saying before, it's, it's, a, it's a very large physical or geographic zone and a huge, not a huge amount, there's a lot of dust in between each city. So it's really, it's not only expensive getting across to Australia, but it's also quite expensive moving around from city to city. So it's not a situation necessarily where you can come to Australia, get in a bus and just move from town to town and, and play small shows and things like that. So 
you actually have to have a fair amount of record sales or a fair amount of awareness for that act before people will actually show interest in actually booking you. So it's a little bit of you know, chicken versus the egg, uh, but it, you do generally do have to have the record that precedes the tour, uh, unless you, you know, you've got a huge bankroll situation, you're gonna do a promo tour and things like that. We should say this one, so we're gonna spend probably half of the panel just taking questions from you, but if there's anything that you wanna ask any of the panels before that, just stick your hand up and we'll, we'll do that. Emily, uh, you were saying to me beforehand that um, in Australia, you know, as a promoter here, you've been referred to more as an agent. What's, what's, how's the, that different? The system, I think because there's only four or five cities to tour in, um, the system's a little different in Australia. In America, you have a booking agent and then you've got local promoters in each city. Um, whereas, and, and those booking agents generally just book the venue um, and sort of hand everything over at that point to a manager or to the band to promote it and, um, and do all the travel and, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas uh, in Australia, those roles are combined um, mo on the most part, but like some, sometimes there's a local promoter involved, but on most occasions um, we will book shows and promote those shows and book all the travel and do all the visas. So we're, we're essentially not only a promoter and an agent, but sometimes also a manager, a label, um, you know, any number of things depending on the scale of the act, whether there's a label involved, whether they have a manager. But yeah, it is, a, it is quite a different system. And um, mounting a first tour, I mean, it can be an expensive exercise. I mean, the keys to sort of minimalising, you know, you've got to get people physically to Australia. As Justin said, there's only a certain number of places to play. I mean, how do you, with, a, with an artist from another country coming in for the first time, how do you look at the budgets? And is it traditionally just that you're going to drop money on the first tour? Or? Um, well, we try not to ever yeah. be in that situation. I think, you know, generally, you know, we have done tours that literally just cover costs, where both the band and us are kind of in on it and sort of decide that this is the best way to sort of take it to that next level um, once the record is out or there's, you know, some buzz on a few songs. Um, but in terms of minimising costs, it's actually pretty hard to minimise the cost because it, the costs are just what they are. You know, five flights from LA to Australia can cost, you know, that's 12 grand, just go on, just there. Um, you know, visas are like five hundred dollars per person. It's it's just really expensive. So unless you can kind of feel pretty confident that you're going to get X amount of payers at each show, or you've got the festival um, the festival option, um, it, it is really really hard to get to the point where you can even do that first cover cost tour. Unless you're a, a one piece or a two piece band, those bands are great because then you can cover the costs a little easier. Um, if you're trying to tour Australia with, you know, a record that hasn't really gotten much traction and you've got eight people in your band, it's probably um, a pretty uphill battle. Um, so, yeah. And also, uh, you know, when, when I, I wrote a book some years ago called The Promoters and, and I pointed out that Australia has sort of more promoters per capita than any other country, you know, and there's a, there seems to be, a, a, do you think there's a diversity of promoters that you should be looking at and finding out who is your right promoter or just Approaching everybody. I mean, there are people like yourself who are known for, you know, specialist, credible tours. There's other people who say, no, I'll tour anyone, you know, and stuff. So, but can you talk maybe a little bit about the difference of Australian promoters? There's, there's difference between a lot of Australian promoters, but then there's not a lot of difference between a lot of Australian promoters. And um, it, it's quite ridiculous, really, when you think of the population and then how many shows take place, how many festivals take place, how many people buy tickets to come and see shows. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, you know, Bon Iver just sold 12,000 tickets in Melbourne, and when you think about the population in Melbourne, it's just like, how does that, you know, it, there's an amazing proportion of people that are going out and seeing music. And so, I mean, there are, in recent years, there's been more and more and more promoters um, and and that's, you know, I, I think there's enough room for everyone and I think it's really just about working with the person that's shown the most interest in you um, and that you feel have a good track record that, um, that you can kind of visibly see that, you know, they're a together kind of organisation that aren't going to put you on a 5am flight, um, etc. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, I think it's really about looking at the bands that they've worked with over the years and, and trying to work out whether you'd be, you know, whether they'd be a good match. Because as I was saying, a, a booking agent doesn't just book the dates, but they also sort of 
represent you in the country um, in Australia. So aesthetics do come into play. Thank you. Um, and, and Grant, I was keen to hear your thoughts on, on our media. You know, we, we have one national radio network, which would be of interest to probably anyone in this room, called Triple J. And then we have a, a number of, uh, you know, a lot of community radio stations, what you call college radio stations, dotted around the country. But maybe just about Triple J and how crucial it is for a band to get, for an artist to get exposure in Australia. Sure. And whether you think you can get traction in the Australian marketplace without Triple J. Yeah. Well, yeah, Triple J, I guess that's the point of difference that we have, is having this national... Um, it's a youth radio network called Triple J, and it doesn't matter whether you live in the city or in the bush, you can gain access to it. And they certainly, um, you know, for the most um, artists, they have a lot of impact, particularly in the live world as well, because they present a lot of the tours and a lot of the festivals. And but still, you know, they're, all of the music from all of the world goes into Triple J, and there's only enough, um, you know, probably 5% of it actually gets fun on the, on the network as well. So. Certainly, I feel very passionately that there are other ways without it. You know, it's, it's a, a great thing. If you have support of Triple J, it's really important. But um, it also depends on the genre. And, you know, there's, there's a few genres that Triple J don't really touch, being a youth network, you know, like adult contemporary music and that kind of stuff. A lot of roots music doesn't really get touched by Triple J, and there's, but there's a real culture of that kind of music in Australia where there is other ways to get around. And Stu touched on community radio, particularly in Melbourne and Perth. Um, Triple R and PBS in Melbourne and RTR in Perth have a really significant impact in those towns. And probably less less or so in the other cities, but they still have great community radio stations as well. And the bridge, like it's an ever-changing thing at radio, but the bridge between Triple J and commercial radio in Australia is probably broader now than it ever has been. We have a, um, a national radio network there called Nova. Um, which is now very much an R&B pop station that used to kind of be competing for Triple J's market. So it was for bands, you know, more credible music and more real music. They had an opportunity to broaden out of Triple J, but probably not there at the moment. Um, and then, you know, the, the one thing that Triple J is, it's a government station as part of the ABC. And the ABC has all of these adult radio networks that play a lot less music but a lot more people listen to it and because there's a lot less music when it gets played it has more of an impact. And the people that actually buy music. Yeah. And, uh, and Graham, I mean, just if you were from another country trying to make some inroads with Australian media, you know, with, with, is there any future in just submitting direct to all these places or do you think it's advantageous to, to work with, you know, the, any number of people in Australia who, who deal with the media all the time? I mean, can you, basically, can cold calling work? Yeah, it's pretty tough. Like, it depends. A great song is a great song, and you know I still believe that they can sometimes find their way beyond all of us and render all of us useless. Sometimes, like a great song can just dominate things. But it's 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 a lot easier. It's like doing things in reverse. And I think you know it's about having those relationships that, that all industries are based on. And if you do hire somebody in Australia that you feel comfortable with, that you know is going to be able to at least get the key people to listen to your music and get it across, I would certainly suggest, you know. And how, how effective um, and important are the, by comparison, I guess, small number of Australian music blogs, you know, focusing on, on Australian music, or so just a small number of blogs in general? I oh, yeah, I think, I think very important. There's a large number of blogs, but I guess there's a small number that have a significant impact, and, you know, again, it's the same thing as here, so, you know, with the media stuff, but, um, yeah. Just a handful, I think, you know, like Mess and Noise and Faster Louder and Polaroids and Androids, is that the one mm -hmm. you um, that seem to have a really good impact. But again, it's all very genre specific and it depends what you're talking about, I guess. Broadly, with the Triple J stuff, we're often talking about independent music and, you know, right now a lot of dubstep is being played on the station as well. Um, and Ian, the role of the publisher. And your, your association, obviously, with Mushroom, with, with the, the Frontier Touring Company and, and the record label, etc. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, first off, an important statistic, the Australian dollar's worth about a uh, dollar five US at the moment. Um, when you make money in Australia, you actually make serious money, whereas it used to be about 75, 80 cents. So uh, that's a uh, 25 to 30% difference in 
if you start to make money, you can actually make money, which is useful for you. Um, charitable for us, of course. Um, when to the foreign royalties. Okay, the Mushroom Group. Um, first off, it's the biggest independent publishing company, but the Mushroom Group itself has been going since 72, and it's quite a, an expansive group of a record label. A touring company called Frontier, where we um, we've just on Food Fighters, for instance, but we also work at a, a, a lower level. What I want to talk about today was, uh, I guess, uh, there's a movie called Ghostbusters. It's called Gatekeepers and Keymasters, and uh, uh, to some extent, that that principle still applies. Um, what I've done over the years is to persuade uh, a certain group of people in America to exclude Australia from world publishing deals uh, and to do a direct deal with me. Um, the, um, I guess the prime examples would be the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, which started with Blood Sugar Sex Magic, uh, White Stripes uh, and the Shins, who are both here uh, this, this week playing. Uh, uh, they uh, managed by a guy Ian Montone, uh, and my relationship with Ian has led them to bring his bands to me. Uh, and similarly, a, a relationship with a lawyer called Eric Greenspan brought me not only the Chili Peppers and Stone Temple Pilot, who were Joe Pure, but recently named called Warpaint. Um, the last deal we just did was a band called Chairlift. Um, and about a year ago, I did a deal with John Silva for the band of horses. Uh, these are, of course, important acts. Uh, I, guess, <coughs> I guess the point I'm making here <coughs> is that we're prepared to do these deals, these direct deals. Uh, it opens up access not only to the publishing company, and there is a, a definite benefit in that, in that, first off, you get a royalty from record one you sell in Australia, your, your, your royalty stream is not cross recurred. Um, but secondly, you get the, uh, the services of, of the Mushroom Music Publishing Company and the wider group. Um, just to expand that, we've got a label called Liberator. Um, the American acts we're doing at the moment that are doing well are uh, Andy Grammer uh, and an act called We The Kings, which are, are basically mainstream acts. This is not all about, um, I guess, the, uh, the Triple J in the town. There's, there's different ways to approach uh, Australia at, at different levels. Um, and it's something that uh, should be borne in mind here that um, I guess the, the acts that uh, really have no footprint elsewhere, as Graham pointed out, it, it's fairly hard, uh, unless you've got a, a pumped up kicks, to actually make uh, a significant impression elsewhere in the world. It's, it's like the, uh, what about the old story about the, uh, the, the actress that sits in the diner waiting for the Hollywood producer to turn up. Well, you know, uh, good luck to you, but it's not going to happen. Uh, we need to see a certain level of activity before these direct deals kick into gear. Uh, but when they do, uh, the door is open in Australia to come directly, and New Zealand, of course, uh, to come directly to us. Uh, and just a quick note uh, on Australian publishing. First off, we got iTunes uh, in shape uh, pretty much before the rest of the world. Uh, we uh, stuck a, a royalty rate with them, which is 9% of retail. It's 1% more than the UK, which is 8%. And here you have this ridiculous penny rate. It's a shambles, the way that <laughs> iTunes has dealt with here. Uh, but what it means is that we've had a pure income stream from iTunes quite solidly for the last, since they started the last two or three years now. Uh, the mechanicals are holding up, uh, but mainly because our economy is holding up, we sell iron ore to the Chinese and they pay us billions. Uh, the right societies are doing well. Uh, the, the game is in fact moving towards the right societies, particularly with the digital world. Uh, and we just had a, a huge win. There's a, a thing called control accounts, which record companies managed to sit on uh, with maladministration. I think the Canadians just picked about 250 million out of the pot. Uh, we've managed to uh, persuade, shall we say, the record companies to give us the control account. So we now uh, have had a windfall in that area. Uh, publishing's pretty healthy in Australia at the moment, Stuart, um, as is, I guess, the, uh, the, the economy goes with it. Uh, and, and from Mushroom's point of view, uh, it, it goes through the publishing company to the record label uh, and obviously up to the touring company. Well, I'm keen now just to hear from all of you thoughts. So just you know, if taking the position that you're, you know, a, an artist from another country, you've built up a little bit of profile in your own country. You've always you, you wake up every night dreaming of touring Australia in the middle of summer, uh, playing a whole lot of festivals. I mean, where do you all think? What are your, what are your first steps? What are the most important things? I mean, is it, is it to get an Australian representative? Is it to get an Australian deal? Or, or you know, what, what do you all think? Right. I have, a, I guess, a vested interest in this because I program the conference big sound that, um, as Stu mentioned before, but you'll probably notice that there's hundreds of Australians that come here every year. And some advice that was given to me before I came as a band manager or as a label representative was to always go to one of these things once before you take your band. And I think it was great advice, and I kind of see that making sense um, with big sound in reverse. Like if you're representing a band from somewhere in the world and you're serious about having a crack in Australia, 
the one thing about that particular week is it's a gathering of the tribes of the Australian music community. So everyone's in the one town for four days and it gives you an opportunity to meet those people and get a sense of where they're placed and perhaps how that fits for, for you and your band in Australia. So that would be my first suggestion before, you know, unless you're managing a, a big band that's got significant, um, you know, momentum already um, and, and interest down there. But if you're just starting a fresh, I, I would be thinking, get yourself down there for that particular week and just, you know, really start making those contacts so that when the time comes that you know where it sits and how it works. This big sound I'm thinking of having international acts showcase, is that something you're moving towards? Or? Well, not necessarily, like at the moment we, we do have some, but it's more about Australian New Zealand music for the rest of the world and, and industry coming. Um, so we spend our, our speaker budget on a lot of um, speakers from outside of Australia and New Zealand to come in and get a sense of what the market's like there. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, first steps for Australian domination? I sort of... For me, it's, it's sort of everything you're doing over here is really impacting on what's going on in Australia. I mean, everyone in Australia reads the same blogs that you guys read. It's not like there's a, a fence up on the internet. So I, I feel like you're, you're setting yourself up in Australia with each step that you take in America. Um, you know, there, there's, it's, that information crosses over to Australia very freely, um, probably sometimes too much. Um, so everyone's across everything there. Um, so in terms of actual practical steps, I suppose um, getting in touch with people like Justin and Inertia or independent label, you know, get, a, get a feel for all the labels, I suppose getting the release um, set up is, is generally probably the first you know, best step. But sometimes you know, we've two bands that don't have, have releases out in Australia and that's generally based on us hearing a song on a blog and really liking it and thinking it's great. So, yeah, hope that answers that question. Um, uh, just building on exactly what Emily said, you'd be surprised how acutely aware Australians are to the global music scene. Australians are so aware as to um, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in the States, what's happening in France, and those things. It, 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 it's a giant sponge, just loves music. Um, and it's, it, it's almost it's like it studies it, but it also does it for, because it enjoys it. Um, so it, you, couldn't, you couldn't really surprise many people um, with what's happening. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about Triple J earlier and things like that. Triple J can actually add songs for, that have been posted on a blog that haven't been serviced to them from a, a, pro, a, a promo company or a record company or a label they can actually curate the music themselves in many instances. Um, you can, I'm sure it would be the same for Emily as it is for others and things like that, where you can actually hear a song and be aware of a certain buzz that's happening with a band overseas in their own backyard and, you, and make, make a gamble and actually start looking at booking that band because it might, you might actually secure dates that are ten, 10 months down the track. You're just making a gamble that come 10 months down the track, something, some traction will have actually happened. So you're almost you know, preempting that scenario. But it's, it's not across the board. They, you know, they are unique case scenarios, but they certainly do happen. Well, they happened with the big day out. It was called Nirvana. Yep. They booked Nirvana for very little money. And about, what is it, 10 months later, Kaboom, it turned out that they had the biggest band in the world performing at their festival. Mm. If you get your A&R right with festivals, it can work out marvellously when it comes. I mean, we, you know, this week it seems like Grimes is probably the big act that everyone's talking about. I mean, I saw her here last year and we secured a deal with her this time last year and just because I thought she seemed really amazing and she hadn't put a record out or anything, but there was just a general vibe about her that just seemed kind of special. <laughs> and um, I think that's definitely how we work and it's probably not how everybody works but um, you know it doesn't have to be this very official thing where a manager takes you know pitches something formal to anyone that you know, we're totally aware of what's going on and I guess the other thing you could be doing is actually just playing a lot here because by the time you get to Australia if you're not really 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 amazing live um, it's really hard to make it work in Australia because Australians are 
obsessed with a good live show and um, I think you know a lot of people do come out and then they're sort of not ready and then that first tour becomes a bit of a waste of time um, so I think you know it's almost like all the things that you need to do are things that you can actually be, just be doing here. It can also go the other way, it can completely stiff. You, know, you, yes. you, can, you, can, you can see bands that actually are just going bonkers here in the States or in UK or continental Europe and things like that and Australia for some reason is the one territory that just doesn't gel. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't a science to it, there really is. Or conversely, I mean, there are some bands who would probably be bigger in Australia than they are in just about any other country. So, I mean, one thing I was taught very early on in this paper is, and I say to artists, just never assume that your biggest market is going to be where you live. It usually is, but, you know, occasionally you'll find bands from the rest of, you know, other countries that their biggest audience is in Australia. And I think everyone's, you know, alluded to the fact that, yeah, Australians have very high expectations of live shows. Um, they go out and see an enormous amount of music, but they really expect someone to be on the top of their game when they see them for the first time. Because we we really do get a not you know given the size of the country, we do get an enormous number of international artists coming through, plus our own artists. And so if someone is not really really great, you're not going to go out and see them a second time. Also, the um, I guess uh, the recommendation of other artists. If, if we're touring with someone and they say, oh, there's a great band back in my hometown, or I've just seen in America. When Dave Grohl tells us that there's someone who's on, we're, we're more than likely to, 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 to follow his advice. So um, I, know, I know it sounds a little bit uh, obsequious, but uh, if you do happen to have mates in important bands, make sure they tell Australians about them. <laughs> now, believe it or not, we're actually halfway through. So do, do we have any questions at the start? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if I was brought up with Australian bands bringing them into the States, or uh, with Sony internationally. Carnival and Kingdom of High Key and Gus Bastion and it's like it's great stuff. Very excited to work with Australian bands. Now we've been trying to put some new American music into Australia. We've worked with a band called The Trues from Canada who have toured a few times. Um, you, were, you mentioned um, having a release in Australia and of course very easy to put something up on iTunes in Australia. Is it still yeah. mandatory to have a CD? release in Australia and have a vocal label or we start? I don't think so. In my opinion, I think, you know, there's a certain level that you get to where it's important and we, you know, physical retail in Australia is still important, but you have to be at a certain level to, to have any profile in the store. And I think now more than ever with it, having access to digital music, there's, there's nothing wrong with creating demand, but, you know, People can't actually find something is actually a good marketing tool sometimes. Because That's they good to know. That's great because in some territories you do still have to have physical like Japan, for instance. Um, so it's good to know. I believe that you know your best record store is your merch at the gig, and as, as long as you've got physical stock to sell there, and then it builds up so that hopefully you know next time you come back to a substantial label is there to support you and then you know, you've got a reason so that you've created a, a demand that then the retailers that count will buy your physical stock as well. So That's great, thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, my name is Carl Dillon. Uh, my question is two part. One is you're talking about dubstep and then we're going Andy Grammer. So there's a very different spectrum. To uh, Andy's one of my favorite new artists. I actually just won a, a, a contest to kind of open through a company that he's using for openers. With that, in Australia, um, do you do it kind of like they do here in the States where either a major label has to place you on a larger tour or there are some bands who actually pay to be on those tours. It's very rare now that you can just be really, really good. And if you're not friends with somebody in the band or your label doesn't put you on and you don't get paid, it's very difficult to get put on maybe a larger tour of somebody who's established. And the other second part to that question is, what is really kind of clicking in Australia right now? Is it more the dubstep or is it still <coughs> pop rock, you know, sing a song, right? Is it all working or is it like, well, if you're doing this right now, you can be very popular. Let's just talk about the award winners. The uh, Aria was won by Boy and Bear. Uh, the AMP award last week was won by the Jezebels. They're quite different acts. Um, no, we're, we're, we don't have a typecast, uh, or no country really does, but you know, I, I think Australia's particularly not typecast in that way. Uh, the reason I mentioned Andy Grammer and We The Kings was to provide the contrast because 
this could become a discussion about Triple J and indie, you know, four-piece indie bands. It's, it's a much broader marketplace than that. Uh, and uh, as Asha pointed out, there's also the whole Roots and John Butler scene, which is on the, on the festival side, incredibly popular. So there's, there's quite a few aspects to it that, which aren't quite viable. Um, as for what works, uh, I think it always comes back to the great song. It's also it's worth mentioning that most of the city is near the coast, so there's a real culture based around that, which I think a lot of the Roots music comes from, and that's the surf culture. So surf and skating, extreme sports culture, and that kind of stuff, which is very specific to Australia, and obviously California, and places in Japan as well. And if you can get into that, the loyalty of those fans based, fan bases that you can access is pretty incredible. And that also works with you know the, the heavy music, the punk and hardcore, and the heavy metal stuff as well, um, You know, for the kids that are growing up at the beaches. Yeah, because I didn't want to do a shopping list with two of my major riders, Jack Johnson and Dominic Frankenreiter, which is straight in the pocket of that. And they're guaranteed royalties, which is the good thing. You know, we're not relying on Triple J or anyone else for Jack Johnson's royalties. That's because he occupies his own space, which I think is probably the lesson for every act. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm not a musician. So I'm coming at this from the licensing side, where I have a product that we license music for from the major labels here in the States. And I was wondering if you could just go a little bit more into the differences between the publishing industry in the States and in Australia, and any differences that you see. Um, well, first off, because of these royalty rates, um, here you've got this almost absurd penny rate system um, and a series of having to issue physical licenses. It's 19th century. I think it's been scientifically designed to be inefficient and to not pay royalties, um, and that's a shame. Um, also, um, unfortunately, um, I've seen the, uh, uh, the decline of the independent publishing companies here. Um, England's very vibrant for independent publishing companies and always has been. Uh, and for a long time, we've had, I guess, the cream of the, the US independents, um, all of which, um, you know, to my satisfaction at the moment, have been consolidated into BMG Chrysalis, which I published. Uh, but I do, uh, I guess, regret in some way the fact that that independent publishing scene, as the independent record scene, uh, is a great source. Uh, to some extent, it has um, um, failed to thrive, is probably the polite way of saying it. I, I wish there were a lot more mutes and big lives. Uh, I mean, look, there's downtown, there's spirit, there's some damn good companies here, um, and I don't want to denigrate it too much, but given the, the marketplace and the size of the places, that this is, there's an unfortunate lack of really strong independence, which is uh, a little bit inexplicable to me. I'm not quite sure why the English can do it with such uh, vigour, and here it doesn't seem to be quite so popular. Got a follow-up question? Um, I guess maybe about um, if you're signing deals in Australia, are you still, like, you would go through you, or you would, are the labels, like, what percentage of hits and known songs in Australia are coming from the major labels over here, and what are coming from Australia? Oh, I guess it's always driven by the act. Um, I mean, uh, the most successful single in the world at the moment is Gosh yet, um, which is encouraging, very encouraging, in fact. Um, it's been a while since we've had uh, a really successful act that's sort of driven things, and as soon as I say that, someone's probably going to remind me of X. Actually, you can probably be the man to do that. Um, I kind of wish, of course, that we would have a, big, a bigger footprint internationally, that it wasn't quite so random. Um, but. Um, I guess uh, that's for the world to decide, not for us. We're, we're always proud of our music. I meant in Australia. Like, what percentage of the hits in Australia are Australian bands, and what are? Uh, quite significant, actually. We've got a decent, a decent chunk of the of the marketplace. Um, I haven't seen the Aria top 100 albums, but there was, I mean, there's, there's usually two or three Australian acts in the top 10, um, which is you know a fair chunk given we're up against the English um, and the Americans. And of course, our mates from Canada and the New Zealanders and whatever the French managed to come up with. Mm. Uh, yeah. um, kind of going a little bit off of that, I was just wondering if you could touch on what it's like for Australian musicians in Australia, kind of what the scene is like for them, and then um, kind of the opposite of what we've been talking about, what it's like to bring an Australian musician here or in the UK, stuff like that, kind of how that process is. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I'm happy to go for that one. Well, I think it's interesting to note, like, um, the, the cities there, like, Sydney is a very expensive city to live in, 
and I would say as far as like bands and you know it has a very healthy electronic music scene but as far as bands who need to have time to nurture and you know sometimes live in a share house and probably you know not work very much to develop into a great band. Sydney's a really tough place because it's one of the most expensive cities in, in the world. And Melbourne's becoming more and more that way, whereas Melbourne used to be, you know, the great, I think consistently since the 50s, I would say Melbourne has been one of the five best music cities in the world. But in the last few years, I, was, I, I think because of the cost of living, there's a lot of bands that are really struggling to, to get to that point because it costs so much money to to take the time off to, to you know manage your craft and Big Sound is in Brisbane and I live in the city in Brisbane and I again am very biased and proud of the music that comes out of there but I think it and Perth have these music communities that are really based on the cost of living where kids can finish school or finish uni and go and focus on being a band because you can't really do that when you're working full time and be great so I think that's part of it. and. Um, you know, I guess what I touched on before, as far as taking Australian music to the world, you know, that's certainly been my goal for the last kind of six or seven years, and it's the same kind of thing as what I was saying about going down and getting to know a music community like in Australia. Because that's what we all do here and have been doing for ages, and you know, I know we do it in the UK and sometimes in Japan and various places, and it's just about finding those contacts. And you know, some people are really great at it. Like there's a, a company um, in Australia called Ivy League who also a, a management company called Whitman and Goldstein. And they were part of Breaking Jet and they're here again with Lanny Lane. And they've just always done a really good job of creating contacts internationally. And, you know, and there's a few people like the, the management team around um, Tent and Track obviously did a really good job in the last couple of years. And that's probably, and you know, they're involved in body air as well. So you can kind of see these are people who've been coming to these kind of things for a decade plus, and they've obviously created relationships and obviously got their ears to, to find the right acts that can work outside of Australia. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I should point out that Ivy League uh, is involved with mushroom, <laughs> and Jackson involved with mushroom. Not to, not to sky, but just to understand the, uh, t the tentacles and how they reach. Um, and, and by the way, there's a reverse thing. Uh, uh, the, the, the guys from the Temple Trap were talking to a, a band called Zulu went to yesterday from London, um, and uh, they quite like the idea of touring together. So that sort of made, let's not underestimate mateship here. That, that crack about Dave Grohl wasn't a joke. I mean, if, you, if you're really in on a, on a personal level because you've got a musical connection with another band that's simpatico with you, then it can, in fact, turn into an Australian tour quite easily, really. And I don't, I don't think you need to be talking even that level. I mean, there's a lot of bands at a, at a much smaller, you know, emerging level that just seem to make friends with bands in other countries and basically do that reciprocal touring of my couch is your couch when and, and you'll headline and, you know, you'll support us in Australia and we'll support you in the UK or Spain or something like that. So. You know, it's uh, it's not the dumbest thing to do is to sort of draw up a list of your favourite Australian bands. It actually just it's pretty easy these days to find ways to contact them, getting the music and going, hey, you want to tour Canada or we want to tour Australia. Yeah. But you had a question. Oh yeah, I'm actually a Texas singer songwriter. I'm actually a Texas uh, singer songwriter. I've been going to Australia for six years now, and um, my girlfriend lives there, and I've kind of cultivated a little. Uh, following in um, Adelaide, actually. And I was there uh, last year and did some shows and it turned out really well, but I've gotten to a point now where it's uh, it's kind of the point where um, sponsorship and visas are a big hassle. Um, is there any um, recommendations anyone can give me about that kind of stuff? Because it's like, you know, it's, it's not legal to just go over on a vacation and start making big money, you know? So it's like, it'll be obvious to go to Marriott, but uh, it's you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's another panel. <laughs> uh, I think you should get a lawyer, an immigration lawyer, yeah. and get or, or get a booking agency in Australia to sponsor you, yeah. or get a label in Australia to sponsor you. But probably start, I, I would probably start with an immigration lawyer, unless you've got some of those things in place already. Some, but you know, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated. It's actually really complicated. I've done it for the past two years now, I've, I've uh, knocked away at that, that, uh, that boulder. Other than the obvious, what's the deal? Okay. 
And then we have had difficulties at least getting the you know, working visas and visas for, for artists to come in and perform in Australia. It's not and, and do you advise coming in without them? Oh no, no, never come without a visa. That's my official line. Um, it's not difficult, it's just a lot of paperwork and everybody in the band and your own party has to sign the same document, which is always, that probably takes about four months to get it to happen. Um, it's just a lot of um, a lot of paperwork, but and it's expensive. But we, we handle all of that. We just kind of guide everyone through the process and and take care of it. So it, it's certainly not rocket science, but just a lot of filling out forms. And questions? Yeah. Could you speak about some of the festivals that you have going there, and which you feel are more appropriate? for particular types of acts. Um, I've been going to the Byron Bay Blues Festival the last couple of years, and I just love that whole environment, what's been created there. So I'm kind of interested to hear about what else you have going on. Should we go through it um, <laughs> chronologically in January? Uh, maybe we should actually utilise someone who's sitting in the audience, don't you? Uh, you were trying to look away, but we actually have Damien Cunningham here with the hat on. Say hello to Damien. Uh, should probably be sitting up here, but uh, Damien's involved with the, uh, the Pete's Ridge Festival. And maybe, Damien, you, would you mind? Could we ask you to talk a little bit about Australian festivals? More than happy to. Um, I, I think the, the, the breadth of Australian festivals is as diverse as there is music in all countries that you're in. I think that there's no, I mean, there is very specific things that look like, like your reference, uh, the Blues and Roots Festival. Blues and Roots Festival is a fantastic festival, but it's not Blues and Roots, just, you know, ostensibly. And uh, the Peace Ridge Festival that I represent and, and book, we book 158 acts, seven stages, everything but hardcore punk and metal. So there is an opportunity for any level or size of act, I think, to tour Australia. And I think it's, it's very, very important to to see that as, as a smaller act that's trying to make a break into an Australian uh, market to hook themselves into a festival or hook themselves into a festival deal. The majority of Australian festivals, uh, apart from sort of the big day acts and probably Spider in the Grass, and do have an access system for acts to apply directly for themselves, either be it's online uh, or through uh, a representative of my Emily who pitches bands to me. Uh, yearly, and, uh, and Justin, the bands that uh, Justin works with through Inertia and through Handsome Tours, which is their side touring company. So it's uh, a great facilitator. I think the last gap that I thought, I think there's over 48 festivals in the calendar in Australia throughout all seasons, and that's and that can be for any genre. <laughs> so um, I personally think it's uh, as, a, as a promoter and a, a small touring company as well, that it's the, the best way to get into Australia. And I've brought acts over that don't have record labels, that don't have any distribution there as uh, a start to getting into Australia. So it's, it's, it, it is difficult because the, the visa issue that sits around it is expensive, works out about $400 per head and there is a viable paperwork to do. Uh, but if you're sensible, if you tick all the boxes, like any, any band that should be looking to come should know the boxes they need to tick. They should be doing well in the home territories, etc. It's it's not rocket science, but festivals happen. Let's talk about Peace Ridge Festival. It happens at the same time as probably five other, other major festivals at the same time, so you can set up a, a really good touring circuit just through festivals, getting some decent money uh, for being paid for them. The relationship, if it's good enough with the festival, will will do all the paperwork for you, will sponsor you, will do visas. Uh, and then do on sales to other events as well. So it's a very viable market for a country that has 22 million people. And, and Damien, when you say that uh, you know if anyone can apply for, say, Pete's Ridge, but and also for a lot of other festivals, um, and you do bring people out who are a long, long way from being household names in Australia, I mean, what are the things that pique your interest in, you know, in an application? Is it how it's presented? Is it stylistically? Or what's the, is, it, is, is there no science to it again? Oh, I think there is. I think it's a common. I mean, uh, for that particular festival that I book, I get over a thousand applications uh, for bands, and this, out of the, the, to be honest, out of the booking side of it, there's probably about 35 spots for those thousand acts that apply. So, if you do have all your ducks in a row, if you do have good, good press, good website, good SoundClouds, good 
uh, you know, all of the music in place. You know, I'm not definitely not going to back somebody, even if it's the best music I've ever heard, that does not have a structure or organisation behind them, or something that is dependable, so they won't get them in the country they can actually they can actually perform. Uh, but I've had applications from Guyana through to Alaska, from everywhere, that just come through. And when it comes and it's good music and it, and it presents itself well, I if there's a band I'm interested in, I look at the application, I look at what's coming, but I do my own research. And if that's not popping up and you're not out there, you're not working your own territory, you know, it, it's not going to put my ears to be successful. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you literally, it's, you've got to have it right as if you're doing it in your own territory. And it's a difficult country, as has been referenced, it's very large, it's expensive to get around, but it's not impossible, impossible at all. You were going to get a lot of business cards at 10 minutes time. Uh, and um, that's about how long we've got to go. So there's a lot of questions. Just very quick. I mean, yeah. if you're going to actually get paid on these things, I'll tell you, absolutely, I'll be back with the play. So what, what could possibly a young new band make for a festival? Depends. Depends on how well they are. But something. Something. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you also have to think about it in not slow, solely in other people. No, sure. You know, smart over who can cross them. And the trees, you talk about the trees, so you know, yeah. they, they, they do this for this year already. Yeah. Uh, They've done two good tours. And that's what I mean as an example the tour of the, the tour, uh, tours that the trees have done have established themselves in France well. Mm -hmm. you know, and they don't have that much you know, exposure. But right. they're not going to take seriously. But most of you know, they'll get some money. Tom? Tom? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the Canadians have been pretty generous about helping their acts tour, and that's an important thing. I'm not sure what your infrastructure is like here, but certainly um, there are ways to get to Australia with government funding and telling them that you're playing a credible festival like a, a piece, which is, uh, goes a long way towards getting that grant application across the line as well. Um, there's a one hand washes the other sort of thing going on here. And, and as Stewie pointed out, and vice versa, although you probably want to tour Canada in the um, summer to manage that. Yeah, we've got time for another couple of questions, if anyone's thinking. Yeah. Are there visas that are easier than others where you look and go, sorry, okay, maybe this band coming from Lagos may be a little bit more difficult than somebody coming from London? Like, is that part of the process that you guys can see? The only time I've heard of more difficulties is if it's from a country, if artists are coming from a country that Australia, the Australian government deems some kind of threat or something. Like a lot of the world music um, festivals have told me about some pretty sort of seemingly racist policies that exist that, you know, suddenly the, the, the paperwork's looked at a lot more closely. But not if that's very, very, very much the exception. It's if you're from, you know, America, Canada, the UK, Japan, Sweden, where it's all there's no issue. So I definitely want to just one for you um, quickly. It's a long way to get to Australia. New Zealand's really close. No matter how sensible is it to route your tour through the two territories, you know, even if you're not as popular in, say, New Zealand as you are in Australia, or...? Yeah, I'm, we're doing more and more in New Zealand, but um, expectations have to be very realistic. The entire country has the same population as Melbourne, so it's, you know, it's... You know, we can't, you can't make money in New Zealand. You know, you can cover your costs from it, certainly on these sorts of levels, these sort of entry point levels. And, you know, I mean, even some of the, you know, it's, it's really hard to get people out to shows in New Zealand. Um, but I have noticed there's a, a bit of an increase in, in the numbers that we're getting, especially for the sort of stuff we do. Um, like we just had a bank of real estate play in Auckland and they got 500 people, which is, insane for a man on that level and I think their sound is very much a New Zealand kind of sound. Um, but it's, I think it's worth doing if everyone's attitude is right, you know, you can't expect much, you've got to go in there and just be happy to just kind of cover your costs and have a good show and get to hang out in a really cool country and, you know, you may as well do it while you're in the, in the area, but um, I think looking at, it as, looking at it as an opportunity to really cash in is, is really not a great way to start. I think it depends on style too, because clearly the musical styles between those two countries are real. Very different. different. And I think, you know, the best way to think about it is with the indigenous culture. In New Zealand, the Maoris have really got a bit, their very own strong R&B and hip hop thing going on, and soul and, and reggae and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of that stuff that will connect and work in New Zealand that would work in, in Australia. And then I guess I'm, 
perhaps some of the indie stuff that works in Australia doesn't really work so much in New Zealand because they don't have a triple J, they don't have anything like that really. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. always a tricky one, there's no rule to it, but that's worth noting the differences. You'd be surprised how different the musical cultures are between those two. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got time for one more if there is one, in other words, we're... Uh, all right, well, thank you, thank you for coming. Do feel free to come up and say hi. I know Asha has got some... Uh, good sound. I've got my book about the Australian promoting industry, if anyone wants to call me. Uh, anyone else selling anything? No. Aussie okay. barbecues. Sorry? The Aussie barbecues on Saturday. Okay. People want to mingle with Australian industry. Very well. This is a barbecue from midday at Maggie May.